The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. That's what we're here this morning for, is to hear the word of God. As we study in major Bible themes, we began a study last week. We were looking at sin. You know, it seemed like an odd topic to talk about in terms of right before Christmas to talk about sin, but actually at Christmas we celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ, and that is God's solution to our sin problem. So it's important for us to understand sin and understand how God solved our sin problem. And so uh, it actually was appropriate. And I, as I talked about last hour, at least I wasn't teaching on the harlot of Babylon uh, at Christmas time, which Pastor Bob actually did at Austin Bible Church. And so that was a that was a tough topic to talk about at Christmas time. At least sin is tough, but it's uh, it's something we need to understand. Well, before we uh, we jump into our study. In major Bible themes, we do need to take a moment for silent prayer. The topic of sin is important because if we enter into a, an attempt, if you will, to try to study the Word of God and we're walking in sin or in darkness as it's described in First John, if we're walking in the darkness, then we won't be able to understand these things because we're grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. So if it's necessary, we need to confess sins during this time. But if we're already in fellowship, then this is a good opportunity to ask for humility, that you would be teachable, and that... The ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, will open up the truth to you this hour just as you need it to be taught to you. So let's take a moment of silent prayer, shall we pray? Most gracious... Almighty and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. And I thank you for the folks that are here this morning. I pray that you will bless this time we have together, that people will be nourished through the truth of your word, and that they will take heed to the ministry of the Holy Spirit who's teaching them this hour, and that whatever it is that they're being taught, whether it's convicting or encouraging or whatever form it may take, that they will not have a hardness of heart that brushes it away, but instead accepts it and that it would be united with faith so that it can be implanted in our souls. Father, we need your word so badly. As the days go on more and more, we should be craving your word more and more because the times are getting darker and darker. And it's so wonderful that we know we can find truth in your word because this world is so full of lies. So help us this hour to understand the truth. Help us to learn what it is you would have us to know this hour and help us to not just gain it as knowledge, but instead help this to become so real in our souls that we can't help but live according to it. Father, help us in our weakness. Help us in our unbelief. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. I forgot to mention in the announcements, our scripture of the week, that's Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Does anybody know off the top of their head what that speaks of? It speaks of the idea of setting aside encumbrances and the sin that so easily entangles us. It has to do with running the race with endurance that's been set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, and so on. This is a very wonderful passage. It's our scripture of the week. I hope that you'll try to memorize this, this, these two verses. We'll talk about that toward the end of class. As you know, it's I've become my custom to, at the end of the class to talk a little bit about our scripture of the week. Very important for us to grasp the concept of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 because really there's been a race set before us and it's not the one that we necessarily have designed for ourselves. It's the one that God has designed for us and so we need to run that race. But we'll get to that at the end of the class. Last time... We finished up our study that we had done on spiritual gifts. I kind of gave a little bit of a recap about how you can try to understand what your spiritual giftedness might be. And then we began our study on sin, its character and universality. Now, this is when we're getting back to the book. Remember, we kind of took a little aside and looked at spiritual gifts because that wasn't a chapter of this book, Major Bible Themes. And now we're getting back to this book. 
uh, major Bible things by Lewis here, Sperry Chafer. And this is, this is an important concept to understand. First of all, we looked at this last time, so I'll do this in review. We talked about human speculation on sin. Remember what, what I was praying about just a minute ago, that this world is full of darkness and full of lies, and there's all kinds of human speculation on what sin is, and it's nonsense. First of all, because sin is such a dominant fact of the human experience, I think, I think you would agree with that, wouldn't you? That sin is a dominant fact of the human experience. It has been the subject of endless discussions. A common feature of non-biblical attitudes towards sin is to regard sin as a misconception based upon some false theory that there is right and wrong in the world. And so in the process of doing that, God and the evils of sin are denied. Now, this is very popular today. It's been popular. This was, this was true when Lewis Berry Chafer wrote this back in, I guess this, this was probably written in the 30s maybe, 20s or 30s. Yeah, in that time frame. Uh, so, and then, of course, it's been revised. But the fact, the fact that this is not something new. Individuals have been trying somehow to deny the reality of sin forever. But we see it intensifying these days where you have the postmodern mindset that, you know, whatever it is, is there, that there is no truth. That when you read something, the only, the only reality there is is whatever you take from it. It doesn't even matter what the author intended when he wrote it. It matters only what you take from it. And this is the postmodern thought. And so there is no right, there is no wrong. And as I mentioned before, this is why... Uh, Ranger Gary Horton is absolutely convinced that more than any generation of young people, he thinks that people today are really hungering for the truth because they're not getting any truth. They're getting a bunch of mush and a bunch of nonsense. And so when he goes in and talks to these middle school and high school kids, they are just excited as can be that somebody has the guts to stand up in front of them and proclaim truth and say, to say something dogmatically. It's actually amazing the responses he says he's getting. But this is, this is pretty, pretty much a, a, a theme in human history, but we see it around us all the time. Oh, it may be, that may be okay for you, but that's not okay for me. And all, and all of this God is denied because the, everybody's saying that, you know, we all set our own standards. So if I want to set my particular standards and they're different from yours, then that's just a different set of standards. And, you know, it's right for me. It might not be right for you, but it's right for me. And it's that whole I'm okay, you're okay kind of a thing. The problem is God is denied because nobody is asking the question, what does God think about all of this, right? I mean, I can, I can sit around in, in my house and I can dream up, uh, dream up whatever kind of set of standards I want, but ultimately his standards are the ones that matter, right? It, what he has come up, uh, come up with uh, in terms of delivering to us in, in his word, the standards, I mean, we understand that God's righteousness is perfect, and we try to grasp his righteousness as much as we can from the truth of the word. So his standards are perfect standards. And that's what we're measured against. That's what it comes down to. But people try to deny that. They don't like the idea of a perfect set of standards. They don't like the idea of being measured against such a thing. An ancient approach to sin, and the second point there, denies that man really sins because they confine sin to the physical world. Basically, the physical world is evil. And it results in two really different kinds of thinking. One of them is asceticism, and the other one is uh, Epicureanism. There's other names for that, licentiousness, whatever you want to call it. It's the, one of them is that, and I talked about this before, just a real quick recap. So the, the, the physical world is evil, but the spiritual world is, is okay, right? That's this thinking. This physical world is evil, the spiritual world is okay. So as a result of that, then the physical body that we live in is evil and it's sinful. So one train of thought is, one tack that people would take is, okay, well, then every single desire that your body has is evil. And I, like I said last week, when, when what some of you, it's probably already happened, but in 30 minutes or so when your stomach starts to growl and you start to feel hungry, this crowd would say that that's evil. That desire for food that your body is having is evil because everything in the physical world is evil. So all desires of the body are evil. And so they try to do everything they can in asceticism. They try to do everything they can to deny the body, any and all desires of the body. The other side of it is they say, okay, wait a minute, hold on. And this is the crowd that 
you know, they, they rationalize really well here, right? They, they say, look, okay, wait a minute, it's just the physical world that's evil, and since I'm both material and immaterial, the immaterial part of me is good, but the physical part of me is bad. So when, I, when my physical body is off doing sinful things, it's just my physical body. It's not really me. I'm really the immaterial part. So if the physical body wants to go have, a, you know, have an affair, or if the physical body wants to take drugs and destroy itself, yeah, what does it matter? It's just physical body and it's evil anyway. So that leads to the idea of licentiousness. You just, have, you just let sin go. And I think I told you before that Terry, uh, years ago, had somebody tell her, I'm, I'm a born-again believer, so I can't sin anymore. Whatever I do is not sin because it's already been paid for with the blood of Christ, so I can do whatever I want. Okay? Uh, I think Paul addressed that, didn't he? <laughs> I think he addressed that idea. So shall we sin more so that grace may abound? May it never be. You know, that's the whole idea. It's not, we, we, we understand that having the freedoms that we have in Christ is not a license to sin. It is absolutely not. But some who would try to answer the whole problem of sin, they would confine it to the physical realm. Now, we understand from the Scriptures that sin... In fact, Christ pointed out that mental attitude sins are a problem. Now, explain to me for a second, is that just something that happened in the body or is that something that happened in the soul? Yeah, that's something that happened in the soul. So now we have sin taking place in the immaterial part of who we are. So now you've got a problem. Their theory doesn't work. It's a, it's a bogus theory. Another common concept is that sin is merely selfishness which ignores the fact that we often sin against ourselves. And I think that's an oversimplification anyway, the idea that it's just selfishness. I mean, is there a selfish component most of the time in sin? Yeah, I would agree with that. But to simplify it and say that sin is just selfishness, I think that's a way oversimplifying. And besides that, any of these theories fall short of the biblical definition anyway. And we want to understand how God defines it. What is sin according to God? Because really, any other definition we come up with is just our own man-made human definition anyway. So let's look at what God says about sin. Teaching of Scripture is that sin is any lack of conformity to the holy character of God. And this was the part that I, that I latched on from the book. Whether it be an act, disposition, or state. Are you in a state of sin? Do you have a disposition that's sinful? Is it an act that's sinful? So sin reaches further than most people want to, want to believe, according to the biblical definition. Various sins are defined in the Word of God as illustrated by the Ten Commandments given to Israel. This is all in review. We did not go look at those. But uh, we understand. You can, if you want to learn about sin, you can learn about sin. In fact, one, I think one of the hardest verses on sin... There's a couple of them, actually. One of them is in Romans and one of them is in James. There's one of them in Romans that says anything that is not of faith is sin. That means if you do anything in doubting, that's sin, right? If it's not done in faith, it's sin. I mean, James talks about the doubting too, right? The double-minded, the one who doubts and is cast about like the, you know, by the surf of the sea and that kind of thing. We understand that. But Romans talks about anything not done in faith is sin, and then we have, in James, it says that if we know the right thing to do and we don't do it, that is sin. To him, that is sin. What does that mean? That is the, the, one, the one who knows what he's supposed to do and does not do it. That's the sin of omission. So now it's not just a sin of commission. It's not like I've committed some act that's a sin. It's now that I knew what to do and I didn't do it. Those are pretty tough. But if you want to learn about sin, open your Bible and study the Bible. We'll teach you about sin. The law was designed to instruct us about sin, how we fall short. It's always against God. We looked at this last time in uh, Psalm 51 and Luke 15. It's always against God, even though it is often directed toward human beings. Now, right, we, we often commit a sin. If I'm just going to pick an example, uh, and I'm not going to look at anybody when I say this example. <laughs> you have a situation between two spouses. That's why I'm not looking at anybody at all, right? Situation between two spouses. I'm going to look back this way. Uh, now, I mean, well, Pastor Bob, what do you look at the clock, right? You just look back at the clock, right? So that way. So situation between two spouses and one spouse becomes ex just extremely angry at the other and is yelling and screaming at the other spouse, all right? That 
is directed towards another human being, but ultimately it's a sin against God. We saw that. Ultimately what's happened is in doing that, you violated God's standards. Now, as I mentioned last week, you have affected a human being when you do that, right? You have affected a human being when you do that. So if you do something like that and you impact another human being with your sin, then you should deal with that as well. But recognize that ultimately your the infraction, the transgression, whatever you want to call it, was against God because you violated His standard. But people can be affected by your sins. Accordingly, a person who sins is unlike God and therefore subject to God's judgment. I thought that was an interesting statement. I took that right out of the book. Is unlike God and therefore subject to God's judgment, right? We fall short of His standard of righteousness. Miss the mark. Hamartia, the idea of missing the mark. Therefore, subject to God's judgment. We have no claim. We can't say somehow that I don't deserve to be punished for my sins because we do. We have failed to measure up to his standards and so judgment is deserved. Doctrine of sin, this is where we stopped last time. Doctrine of sin is presented in the Bible in four ways. And as I mentioned before, there's kind of a coupling here, if you will, of of a couple of these. First, First point here, personal sin. It's the form of sin which includes everything in the daily life which fails to conform to the holy character of God. Personal sin. I don't know about you, but I commit personal sins. I don't know, I'm looking at some of you. Maybe some of you guys don't. We all do. We all do, right? All of us do. In fact, you're going to do well if you can avoid committing one between now and when the class is over. I don't know about you, but I, when, I, when I would sit out in the, in the well, it was actually in the chairs at ABC, but when I would be sitting out in the chairs at ABC, it was often I had to stop and confess my sin in the middle of the class because I couldn't make it through the Bible class without committing some mental attitude sin of some kind. We all fail to conform to the holy character of God from time to time. Those are personal sins. Secondly, we have the sin nature, the very corruption of the flesh that occurred at the fall of man and resulted in a depraved character. We are depraved in character, enslaved to sin in Adam and all of his posterity. So this sin nature was part of the fall, and you can thank Adam for this, that we all have this sin nature, right? Now, we talked about this before. My sin nature is slightly different than your sin nature over the time, as there's been generations after generations. There's been a morphing, if you will, of the sin natures. And so I have areas of weakness in my sin nature that maybe you don't, but you have areas of weakness that I don't. And so we all have different struggles in that regard. But the sin nature is something we all have. These two are coupled together because as James taught, it is the giving in to the lusts of the flesh or the sin nature itself. It's the giving in to that. And that's a volitional choice. The giving in to this is what produces personal sin. So these are coupled together, the sin nature. But but recognize these are both categories of sin in Scripture. We have the sin nature itself, the old man, and we have personal sin, the old sin nature, as this is often called. Then we have imputed sin. Adam's sin credited the account of every member of the human race, resulting in universal condemnation in Adam. And that's actually very important. It's a very important doctrine to understand. It is critical because we talk about there's... There's, God has done wonderful things to even the playing field, right? He's done amazing things to even the playing field. Everybody is held under condemnation. They're under sin, as it talks about here with the estate of sin. We have the imputed sin of Adam. We're all guilty as charged. None of us can try to claim somehow that we're better than the other person and don't deserve eternal condemnation. Because we're all under this. We all have received the imputed sin. It's been given to our account. We're all held accountable in Adam. That's one of the ways he levels the playing field. It's actually awesome because then we're all at the same place of standing. And so when we go before, uh, when we go before the judgment seat of Christ, we know that we were in Adam. And the only claim, what's the only claim we have that keeps us from being thrown into eternal condemnation? That's it, right. We have have placed our faith in Christ, and and because we have placed our faith in Christ, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And because our name is written in the Lamb, is it because we deserve that? No. 
I don't deserve that at all. I deserve to spend all of eternity in the lake of fire. That's what I deserve. But I'm not, I know that I won't be there because God in His grace has allowed me to be saved from that through the blood of Christ. But this, is an, this, is, this evens the playing field. Gary, one, one moment. Gary's also talked about the evening of the, uh, of the playing field in terms of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful thing to contemplate. It's not on the slide, but I want you to think about that. Because each of you is a, a, a house, a temple, if you will, for God the Holy Spirit, and He dwells in you, each of you has the exact same capability as anyone else to learn the truth of God's Word. It's not a matter of whether you can go take an IQ test or you like doing the Mensa puzzles or if you... It doesn't, none of that matters. None of that matters at all. The Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. This is another great equalizer that we're all equal in terms of our guilt because of this imputation. There was a question back there? Yes, I am. Sin nature is the corruption of the flesh itself. The imputed sin is actually, if you want to think of it, it's almost kind of an accounting thing. Adam's sin has been credited to your account. We often think of righteousness being credited to our account based on faith, right? We always think of that. This is actually the crediting to our account, if you will, of Adam's sin. It is imputed to our account. So it's a crediting to our account. It's different from the sin nature. Yes, it is. Yeah, some people, some people actually do connect these two. And in fact, they'll even incorporate the estate of sin in with that in the idea that the reason why we're in the estate of sin is because of our sin nature. They'll actually take it that way, but I don't. I, I consider these to be all separate categories. The sin nature is, is the corruption of the flesh. The imputed sin is the fact that God has credited to all. In other, in other words, way, another way to think of it is we're all held responsible for what Adam did. He's our corporate head. He is the head of the human race, and we're all held responsible for what he did. That's another way to view imputed sin. Because of that, we're in the estate of sin. This is very important too. This is the positional reality of being under sin. That's the language that's used. Under sin at physical birth and thereby having no ability to save ourselves. We're under sin. We are locked in that estate. We cannot save ourselves. Don't have any ability to do that. Try as we might. I can try. This is something um, recently someone in, our, someone in our flock had a conversation with a relative and the idea that, of this relative was that they just had to try to do good things. As long as they could do some good things, then they could, they could make their way into heaven. And if you understand, this is why this doctrine is so important to understand. If you understand the estate of sin, if you understand being locked under sin, and that's a grace gift from God, by the way, because think about it for a second. How good would be good enough? How good would be good enough? I don't care how good you ever were. There's always somebody who's going to be better. Right? If there's anything I learned, if there's anything I learned in my experience when I was in my 20s of trying to be a professional bowler, it said no matter how good I was, there was always somebody better. In fact, there were a lot of people that were better, which is why I stopped being a professional bowler. But that's the truth, is that you, no matter how good you are, there's somebody better. Okay, so where, where's, where's the standard? Where does, where's the line drawn? The beauty of it is if you understand this doctrine, you understand that if... Somebody in here can throw a football 50 yards and I can grab that football and I can throw it 55. There's somebody else who can throw it 60. There's somebody else who can throw it 70. And none of that's good enough. And if you understand all of this, the idea of being the imputed sin and the estate of sin, then you recognize, I can't do it. I can never produce righteousness that is God's righteousness. I can never on my own, this is important, I can never on my own somehow save myself. It's actually a beautiful doctrine, I think, because when you finally understand that, then you realize that you're helpless. And when you actually come to that place, that you realize you're helpless. This, is, this, is, this was actually something I went through in my own salvation experience, if you will. I realized I was utterly helpless, that there was no way I could, I could help myself out of this condition I was in, this estate of sin, and the only way was through faith in Christ. I think that's what has to happen. We have to be broken. That's exactly, what, that's, what, that's exactly the terminology that Ranger Gary Horton used. He said, God breaks hearts. And that's how people get saved. Because you have to be broken. You have to realize you can't do it. And when, he, when you get to this point and you realize that the reality of this, that you cannot save yourself, that's the moment when you're actually ready to hear the gospel. 
when you're ready to hear, okay, you can't save yourself, but guess what? God devised a plan whereby you can be saved, and he sent his son to do it. He sent his son to make it happen. Personal sin, let's talk about this. It relates to some particular command of God in Scripture. I think we'd all agree with that. It's the idea of missing the mark of God's own character of holiness. Why do I say, why did I say the first point, by the way, relates to some particular command of God in Scripture? How do we know about sin? It's always through the Word of God that we know about sin. And we, some of them, like I said, are tough. That sin of omission thing, that's pretty tough, isn't it? But that's, there's, there's, a, there's a verse we can go to, and it tells us about that, and now we know about that sin. The one about anything not done in faith, that's the same way. There's something in the Bible that tells us, and that's what hel- helps us to understand Sins. Missing the mark is the hamartia. That's the Greek word for, the, for, the, for that, the idea of missing the mark. Romans 3.23. Turn there in my Bible. I should be able to find Romans easier than Joel. I was looking for Joel last hour, and it wasn't in my Bible, I didn't think. But it turned out to be. I just was inept. I've gotten overly and completely spoiled by my electronic Bibles. And so when it comes to some of the books, I have a hard time finding them. Romans 3.23, now we know this passage, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what do we have there? It's hamartano. That's the verb that goes along with the idea of the hamartia, the missing the mark. All have sinned, and, right? All sinned, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They could have said missed the mark there because that's what the idea is. Now what's beautiful in this is the context That's why I did it the way I did it there. I wanted to be able to back up. In verse 21 of Romans 3, we see, Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's basically the uh, words used to describe the Old Testament there. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there's no distinction. There's no reason to even discuss whether one person or another person needs to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. We all need to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no distinction between Jew or Gentile. There's no distinction between Americans or non-Americans. There's no distinction between men or women. There's no, forget the distinctions. There's no distinction. Forget all of that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yet, that's why I love the context here. Even the righteousness of God has been manifested through faith. Because that ties back to this idea of the righteousness of God having been manifested. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. That's it. That's the only way, folks. I hope everybody that's in this room knows that. But it never hurts to speak of it again. That none of us can be saved. None of us can be rescued from eternal condemnation apart from faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That's it. And I go on and say even further that as a born-again believer, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you are born again, you are a new creation in Christ, you cannot produce in your walk any righteousness that means anything apart from God either. All of that is is done through God. All of it is done. And that's actually a beautiful thing. It's freeing when you realize that uh, that all you could possibly do is swim against the current and get nowhere on your own. In the power of the flesh, you're never going to get anywhere. It's hopeless. And when you have that understanding of helplessness and you realize that the only way you can be saved is that you receive the very righteousness, righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, that's a powerful thing. That's a powerful thing. It's liberating to know. And that's a true testimony to the love of God. There's, there's no better testimony to the love of God than the fact that he would send his son for us. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is which is in Christ Jesus. Goes on from there, a wonderful passage, but we miss the mark. That's the Hamartano or the Hamartia. It includes the aspect of rebellion or disobedience. Personal sin does. Now as a let's consider it as a, a believer, right? You're a believer and we still commit personal sins. Are we rebelling against God when we commit a personal sin? We are. There's a, there's a, there's a, a sense of that. And what I mean by that is I, it's sort of a, it's our own little personal declaration of independence. We commit the same sort of a, 
offense that Satan did in terms of saying we're going we're gonna to somehow it function independently from God. We have that prideful moment just like he did. I'm going to do this. I know God told me to do this, but I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to do what God wants me to do, and I'm going to go do this, right? So there's this rebellion. There's this disobedience, this act that's involved. Now, what about, what about unbelievers? That's all they know is disobedience, right? That's it. They're children of disobedience. That's what we once were also. We're not supposed to continue in that, by the way. Just because we once were doesn't mean we're supposed to continue in that. But the point of it is that's, that's all unbelievers know. They're slaves. They're utterly enslaved to their sin nature, and they just that's all they know is committing these acts of disobedience. As I mentioned before, it can be an act of commission or omission. James 4.17 is the verse I was referring to before, if you want to turn there with me. James 4.17. Now, a person, a person is being addressed in this passage, but we are all uh, in view because it's not talking about a particular person. It's talking about anyone. When it says to one who knows the right thing to do, that could be anyone. It's not talking about one particular person. It's talking about anyone. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, what does that mean? Do I even have to give examples? Think about your own life. There's been times when you knew the right thing to do and you just didn't do anything. Again, this is not where you go and commit a a particular act that is sinful, but instead you did not do what you knew was the right thing to do. Now, how do you know the right thing to do? Through the Word of God and through the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. Again, remember, his ministry is such that it'll never be in conflict with the word. Never, ever. If you ever think that a spirit is talking to you and it says something that's contrary to the word of God, then it may be a spirit talking to you, but it's not the Holy Spirit, right? So be careful of that. But we know the right thing to do, and we're instructed over and over again from the scriptures of the right things to do, and yet there are times when we don't, and that's a sin. So it can be commission or omission. The sin nature itself, man's entire nature was corrupted in the fall. Take a look at a couple of passages here. Go back to Romans again, Romans 5.19. This is one of those passages, by the way, that... this This is a scripture reference that I took from the book, and as I was looking at this... I was considering it and saying, okay. It says, as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And this is the example given. It goes on to say the law came in so that the transgression transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here in verse 19, though, many were made sinners. This is an example given to describe the corruption of the flesh turning into the sin nature. But could you make an argument there that this is also talking about our estate of sin in Adam? Could you make that argument? Some could make that. In fact, I read some commentaries that were talking about that, not talking about the sin nature itself, but instead that we were all made sinners in that we were all in Adam. Right Through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And so you could make a legitimate argument that that verse is talking about the fact that we are in Adam and in accountable for his sin as well. This is an example that was given. Ephesians 2.3, 2, uh, Ephesians 2, I can't speak. Ephesians 2.3. This speaks a little bit more clearly to it, I think, because this is talking about where we were as unbelievers. We'll back up to verse 1, Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. See that that terminology right there, the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were nature, excuse me, were by nature 
children of wrath, even as the rest. All right, well, one thing this verse does for sure is uh, if you ever, in your own spiritual walk, see, I've been saved since I was 17, so that's 36 years or so. If we're walking with the Lord, at some point, do we start to become prideful? Do we start to forget what this verse says? Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Do I forget? Should I ever forget that I'm a sinner saved by grace? I should never forget that. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Now, again, does this verse really argue the idea that the the flesh was corrupted? Not really per se, but the idea of the sin nature is evident. By nature, children of wrath, right? We were very by our very nature. Now, when did that come about? See, here's the thing. Here's what you got to understand. Were Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, were they by nature like this? No, no, they were not created that way in the garden. But after the fall, what this says is all of us, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh by nature this was our very nature so you can understand from this that there was a transformation something changed right people by nature follow the lusts of their flesh as pastor bob would always like to give the example dogs bark cats meow unbelievers sin They're, that's their nature is to sin that's what they do sinners sin right um That's the idea. So this is a change. You can see that this is describing a very different environment than what was created in the garden. When Adam was created and then Eve was taken from Adam, they were not like this by nature. And we understand that they fell into sin, but it was not their nature. So a change has taken place. This is a good passage, though, like I said, to to, if you ever have a moment of pride in your in your own Christian walk, just read that that passage and it'll remind you that you're a sinner saved by grace. Now, this is an interesting um, point here. It talks about our sin nature. It includes man's will, conscience, intellect. Man's understanding has been darkened and his heart is hard. This is talking about the, very, the, the natural nature of mankind. Thankfully, praise God that when you're born again, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, what does God do? It's the whole idea of born again, the regeneration. There's this new You're made spiritually alive, and there's a newness within you, the new self, that's not like this. And in fact, some people are confused by it, but as if you recall, when we studied through 1 John, I mean, some of you went through 1 John with us, uh, others haven't. Yeah, that's all online. I have CDs of that study if you want to go through it. But there's a passage in 1 John that some people are confused by because it says, it's it's translated as, no one who is born of God sins. And people say, oh, well, then that, that person that talked to Terry must have been right that, you know, if, uh, if they're born again, then they can't sin. That's not what it's talking about. What that's talking about is your new self, that new creation in Christ, that that has been born again of God. That is part, the part of you that doesn't do that. When you're, when you're walking in the newness of Christ, when you're walking in that new self, you will not be committing sins. The problem is we go back to our old self. It's the whole problem that Paul talked about of the struggle between the new and the old self. It was a str- Here's Paul, who was this believer that we all look up to. We all wish we could have been there and met Paul and looking forward to meeting him in heaven, not as much as Christ, of course. Hopefully you're not. Hopefully you're looking forward to seeing your Savior more than Paul. But won't that be awesome? We'll, we'll recognize him when we see him too. But, um, but here's this, this believer that had amazing maturity, and yet he struggled with the old self, new self. This is a description now, what we have here is of the old self. Man's will, Genesis 8, 12, uh, 821, excuse me, Genesis 821. The key phrase is here, right there. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. And now what, what is that saying right there? That key phrase, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Even our very desires, our will, as an unbeliever, our very will has been corrupted. The conscience, 1 Timothy 4.2, go from one end of your Bible to the other. Almost. 
First Timothy chapter two. Four. First Timothy chapter four, excuse me, verse two. It says the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to, to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from p- foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Now, doesn't this go back into what we were talking about in terms of the lies about things, right? The abstaining from marriage and I mean, forbidding marriage and abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it, if it is received with gratitude for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Now here... What do we see? Seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. This is speaking to these individuals, the hypocrisy of these liars who are seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. In other words, the conscience, and I, didn't even, I don't even know if I have this verse up there, but the conscience itself can become defiled. And that's a really scary thought because as an unbeliever, what do you have to guide you if you, don't have, if you don't have God, if you don't have Christ, what do you have to guide you in any direction whatsoever is... Your conscience, that's it, right? That'll give you some kind of a guidance. But what about if you can steer your own conscience, defile it to the point where now the things that you thought were bad, you don't even worry about anymore. It doesn't even bother you anymore. When you were, in fact, uh, I'm picking on Pastor Bob a little bit today, but he was teaching in Romans about how that's the idea of being turned over. At some point, God can take unbelievers and turn them over where they don't even, to, me, to them, it doesn't even mean anything anymore. Things that were bothersome to them before, eh. They're just mired in their sin, and they get deeper and deeper into it. It's a scary thought. The intellect itself, and I didn't, I didn't highlight that with a, a link. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4. I meant to fix that. It says here, 2 Corinthians 4.3, it says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the glory of the uh, excuse me of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So what he had blinded the minds, blinded the minds of the unbelieving, right? So the very intellect has been has been altered. In this case, it's talking about who's doing that. Who's doing that? In this case, right? So it's Satan that's doing that, the God of this world. Satan is doing that. But let's recognize that our intellect itself can be affected. That's important to understand. And man's understanding has been darkened. His heart is hard. Ephesians 4.18. Let's turn there. Ephesians 4.18. I'm always always amazed. Uh, I'll take a little aside here. Ephesians 4. We're going to read 17. And 18, Paul over and over again in the scriptures implores believers to walk in a manner that they should walk in. And there are those out there who would tell you that if you're truly born again, that that's the only way you can walk. And so you can't possibly walk in a way that would be displeasing to God. It's a false doctrine. It's false teaching. You read this passage. How can you not understand? He's to, what is Paul doing? He's talking to believers here. And he says, This I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. Now here Gentiles is used in a manner, we've, we actually looked at this verse before, Gentiles is used in a manner to describe unbelievers. In the futility of their mind, and there's another one that talks about the mind, doesn't it? The futility of their mind. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greed. Now, now, look, let's ask the question, is he talking to believers? <laughs> look at verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. And then he says, okay, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. So this description we have here is of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance 
with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. I told you guys I got a chance to meet with Pastor Drew Smith in, uh, in Huntsville at Doctrinal Bible Church over there in Huntsville, and he's teaching right now on this whole idea of putting on, the idea of clothing ourselves, right? We're supposed to, be clo- we're supposed to clothe ourselves with Christ, put on the new self, which in the, you're supposed to put on the armor too, right? Put on the armor. Think about all the passages that talk about putting on, the clothing ourselves with these things. Put on the new self, with the, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And this is what I was talking about, that new self that we received at the moment we were born again, that new self has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. But unfortunately, we often do not lay aside the old self. We go back and we practice just as in this case it says the gentiles also walk so paul is giving a warning here to believers believers don't act like unbelievers and we certainly can we looked at we looked at the idea of the returning to the vomit that's a passage that talks about that as well returning to our vomit as believers we can go back and act just as bad or worse than we were as unbelievers imputed sin uh yeah, we'll go ahead and start taking a look at this, and then I'll take a break, and I'll talk about the, um, I'll talk about the Scripture of the week. Imputed sin. When Adam sinned, we all sinned with him. Romans 5, 12. Right? So what do we have here? What am I going to here? Same sort of passage where we had that other reference, right? That's what I'm saying. Romans 5 is later in Romans 5, but still. Therefore, just as, one, just as through one man sin entered into the world... And death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And it goes on from there. But see, this is the idea. Through one man, sin entered into the world. We were with him effectively. We all sinned. By the way, I haven't really taken a lot of time to talk about this, but one of the things, if you were doing a more thorough study of this, we're not, we're doing more of an overview, but if you were doing a more thorough study of this, You would actually look at passages where you have sin singular and sin is plural because that's actually significant. When sin is mentioned in the singular versus sin being mentioned in the plural, that's a significant thing to consider. Sin entered into the world. We were all effectively in Adam when he sinned. It's been imputed to the entire human race as we see in verses 13 and 14 as I just read. This is beautiful. For until the law sin was in the world... But sin is not imputed and when there is no law. It says here in verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. So you could say, well, look, I never committed the sin Adam did. I never partook of the fruit that I wasn't supposed to eat, well, whatever. The fact of the matter is, through one man sin entered into the world, and death, that is spiritual death, Reign from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, right? So you can't claim any exemption on that basis either. We were all effectively in Adam, and we're all held accountable in Adam. Yes? That's a great question. For those who are on the Shoutcast or on the MP3, et cetera, I'll repeat the question, the idea of that was there already a sin involved in the fact that Adam, for example, uh, should have... Well, first of all, what was he doing letting Eve talk to the serpent in the first place? Let's talk about that. You know, It's like the serpent comes up and it's like, sure, you can talk to my wife, no problem. Uh, what, what was that, right? That was crazy in the first place. Then he should have known better and he should have interrupted the whole thing and said, wait, 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 this is all lies. We can talk through all of that. But the fact of the matter is the one thing that they could not do that was subject to the penalty was to actually partake of the fruit. So all the rest of those things, we can talk about those things in terms of those things that were not, I mean, did, did Adam shirk his responsibility? Absolutely. <laughs> he did. Was there, was there uh, failure on his part? Was there failure on Eve's part? Uh, we learn in the New Testament, Eve was deceived. And from that, we can gather that Adam was not. 
and yet he still ate of the fruit, right? He still ate of the fruit. There was all kinds of problems there. But the one thing that was defined by God that they could not do that was under penalty of, of spiritual death was to eat of that fruit. And that's when they, if you want to say it this way, that's when they actually committed the first transgression because they transgressed the command of God when they committed that act. And so you say to yourself, okay, well, what if they hadn't eaten of the fruit but all those other things that happened? We can get into a speculation game from now until the end of time, right? But the fact is... Uh, that, that all of those things were things that shouldn't have taken place, but it was the act of eating of the, the fruit that caused them to die spiritually. And ultimately, the ramifications of that, that they ultimately they died physically, they were separated from the tree of life and they died physically. So, good question, but I don't think you can necessarily see it. It all depends on how you want to how you want to describe that. Were those things that were ill thought out things that shouldn't have taken place but were they were they sin because god had given them this description of what they could not do and so were they sin right were they sinful those things that they did it's a great question i would say the answer to that would be no because well it's certainly not transgression because transgression means when you violate something that's given to you as a command in the scripture you transgress and sin is what, what does it say in, in 1 John? All of that is sin, right? So that's what it says. So you can make an argument that, that in fact, I think, didn't, did we not have a discussion about that one day at ABC? That there were all kinds of things that Adam could not do that today we understand would be sinful for us, but, you know, they were, they were not things that were given as, as rules for him. Uh, so... And then Pastor Bob actually went through a whole list of those, and the funny part was, and then he said something about adultery, and that's when Gary Williams said, nope, because <laughs> there were no other women, right? <laughs> so he couldn't do that. But uh, and so anyway, but, but there, there, if you really understand how this works, uh, they, was there an element of pride potentially in that or disobedience in that, or was there ele- an element of, of something that was, wasn't right in that process? Yes, but I would, I would say that the actual sin itself was when they partook of the fruit because that's what they were instructed not to do. They violated the command of God. The promised consequence of death, which is given in Genesis 2.17, has been applied to every member of the human race. We'll come back to this point next time because I need to talk about the scripture of the week. But the promised consequence of death has been applied to every member of the human race. Right. So what happens? When you're born into this world... You're born spiritually dead. Now, we could have discussions about whether you have no, no human spirit whatsoever and then when you believe, you receive a human spirit. But I believe the language, if you want to use the old King James language of the quickening of the spirit, is the idea, and it's, we actually read about it being made alive together, right? Made alive together, is that we do have a human spirit that's dead, and that the moment we place our faith in Jesus Christ, our human spirit is made alive. That's the quickening in the King James language, may, being made alive. And so, but one way or the other, we're spiritually dead. And that is, that is part of that whole thing of being separated from God is our spiritual death. And we're all under the consequence of spiritual death as a result of uh, the original sin. We'll look at this next time. We'll come back to that and look at it next time. But... I want to talk about our Scripture of the Week. Again, what I encourage you, I encourage you to memorize these if you can. You know, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, right? So the idea is you want to be able to get to the point where you can quote that word for word if you can. But more than that, what I really care about is that you understand the basic principles here. The idea of the laying aside of the encumbrances, the sin which so easily entangles, running the race with endurance, right? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, not forgetting what it says here in the rest of this, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You want an example of endurance? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 is not part of our memorization, but this tells you a good reason to learn this. 
For consider him, in other words, that's a thinking thing, right? Consider, that's a thinking word. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you ever find yourself in your own spiritual walk growing weary, losing heart, this is a wonderful passage to come back to because it encourages us. We can consider him our Savior. So I'm going to read through this ver- I'm going to read through these two verses one time, uh, and then we're all going to read it together. And a second time as I go through it, we're going to all read it together, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. It says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, read it with me as I go through it again. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, well, let's talk about this briefly. We're already near the end of our time. Let's talk about this. Cloud of witnesses. What comes right before this in Hebrews? Hebrews chapter 11. What is Hebrews chapter 11? The Hall of Fame of Faith, right? This cloud of witnesses, and it's all about their faith. Some of them we may not understand because it talks about the faith of Samson, for example. And when you look at the scriptures that we have on Samson, and it seems like, man, I don't, I don't know. But it's, it's there, so we have to understand the faith of Samson. So we go through this, and we look at this, cra- this great cloud of witnesses, right? The testimony. What has been given a, to us in the scriptures is to teach us. For the people at the time that the New Testament scriptures were written, they were being exhorted that they had the Old Testament scriptures, and that was for them to learn from. Now we have both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and all of it is designed for us to learn from these things. Then it says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Okay, first of all, let's get it straight right now. Sin easily entangles every one of us, your pastor included. Every one of us can be easily entangled in sin. The point of that is, if you think you're tough enough and rough enough that you're not going to fall into sin, you're deluding yourself. You are deluding yourself. We can have strength in God, and He will help us to resist the temptations that come along. But the point of this is that we need to have an awareness. And we're learning about sin in our major Bible themes topic. But what I'm telling you this passage is saying is that sin can grab us so easily, we need to have a proper respect for how easily we can fall into sin. Because if you don't, 1 Corinthians says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall, right? Because the point where you start to think you've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it together. Sin doesn't have any hold over me anymore. Look out, <laughs> you're in trouble, you're in trouble. Sin easily entangles us, but look at what just came right before that. Every encumbrance. You all, in, your, in the privacy of your own priesthood, in your souls right now, think about your life. What do you have in your life that's not sinful, That's an encumbrance. What do we mean by encumbrance? It stands in the way of you being able to live your life for the Lord. It's in between you and what it is the Lord would have you to do because what comes right after this is running the race that's been set before us. So what do you have in terms of encumbrances in your life? We all do, if we're honest. We all have things. They're not sinful. I'm not trying to tell you, every time I talk about this passage, I have to remind you, I'm not trying to tell you, you can't, you can't sit down and watch UT win a football game. You haven't somehow committed an egregious sin if you take some time and sit down and watch a football game. 
But if it's hindering your spiritual walk, if it's an encumbrance to your spiritual walk, that's a problem. For example, if you sat around all day yesterday and watched every football game on ESPN, you probably didn't get much done because it started in the morning and it finished late at night. So that can become an encumbrance. And you in your own soul have to figure out what's an encumbrance and what's not. Uh, we, have, we, we sit around and we, um, you know, you know, we do things in our lives that are entertaining and fun and there's nothing wrong with those things uh, as long as they don't become an encumbrance. What is it that is getting in the way of our spiritual walk? And this is the key, the race, run with endurance, the race that is set before us. This morning, I told Terry, I, was, I said, it's so funny that the Lord put it on my heart to have this as the passage. Because I, I got to tell you, this morning, all I wanted to do was crawl back in bed and stay there until about noon. That's what I wanted to do because I was cold. I didn't want to go outside in the cold. You know, I was tired. I didn't sleep well last night. I was tired. I wanted to stay in bed and just wake up about noon when the temperature had warmed up, right? You guys, I know some of you are cold in here. I apologize, but uh, at least it's warmer than it is out there. But, uh, but this is not what I did. What I did is I got, got it together and I came here because this is the race that God has for me to run, right? If I've become selfish about it and I do what it is that I want to do in my selfishness, then I'm never going to run that race, First of all, the, the, the whole mind attitude here, the heart attitude is that I want to know what that race is. It goes back to what we talked about in spiritual gifts. You should want to know what your spiritual giftedness is. Why? Because you should want to know what it is. To me, it's a powerful thing. One of the most encouraging things when I was saved, when I was 17, was to find out that God had a purpose for me. Well, this is part of that. He's got a race for you to run. And it, by the way, it's not necessarily a real pretty one. I ran the marathon in 2000, and I didn't like it when I came to the parts where we were running uphill. I hated those parts where I was going uphill. I was so tired, I didn't want to run uphill. But sometimes, you know what? That's what it feels like, doesn't it? It feels like we're running uphill. So run with endurance. That's another important phrase in there, with endurance. Now, is that the endurance of just... A self-will, I'm going to try real hard and I'm going to do it, I'm going to make it. Well, of course, there's some, there is some positive volition involved, but where does the endurance come from? I mean, it comes from God. It comes from God. He strengthens us. In fact, Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. And what he was saying is, it's when we're weak and we can't do it, we can't have any delusion of doing it on our own, then we turn completely to God for the strength to do whatever it is we're going to do. And that's when we're strong. When we're, when we're strong in our own strength, that's when we fall short. Run with endurance, the race is set before us. Now, I'm telling you, if you really do this, if you really do what that says, you're going to have to settle, set aside a whole bunch of your own plans because the race that he set before you probably doesn't have a lot to do with your own plans. And so... I encourage you to really do this, to really begin to think about running with endurance the race that is set before you. But as you do, you're going to have to set aside your preconceived notions of what your life is supposed to be. And you're going to have to consider what God wants your life to be. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's huge. That's huge. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Why is that important? Because what, did I, what have I told you guys recently over and over in, in, the, in the previous weeks? We are bombarded with the senses, the sights, the smells, the touch, the sounds, right? All of these things. We're inundated with input from the senses constantly. So we're constantly, our focus is taken to what? The temporal things. What's here? What's now? If we can fix our eyes, now this, is this talking, let me ask you a question. I take the Bible literally. Is this talking about my pointing my eyes on a, a depiction of the cross that has Jesus hanging on it or something like that? Is that what, no, that's not what that's talking about. This is talking about the eyes of my mind. I'm focusing my thoughts on Christ. I'm taking my thoughts off of whatever it is. Whatever it is, the difficulty of running the race, whatever it is, I fix my eyes on Jesus because... Because he's the author and perfecter of faith who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. If I can look at him and I can see what he did in going to the cross, 
And as what, it goes back to what I said before. We want, as believers, we want to keep going back to the cross. Keep going back to the cross. Because if I can put my eyes on him and look at what he did, what he endured, the shame, the suffering, the death of the cross, and he did that for me so that I might be saved, doesn't it seem pretty easy for me to go through whatever I'm going through? So that's one aspect of it. Beyond that, what is, what is my Savior doing for me right now? We're, that's the past, right? What he went through with the cross. What is he doing for me right now? He's my advocate. He's interceding on my behalf. It's not like he did this and then he went and sat down on the throne and then kicked back and crossed his legs and said, eh, I'm just going to hang out for a while. That's not what Jesus is doing. He's still thinking of you right now. So if you can take your eyes and focus it on what he went through at, when he endured the cross, and think about now, that's, that's the important part of this. He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's the session. Talk about the death, the burial, resurrection, ascension, and session. He is seated at the right hand of God. And what does he do while he's at the right hand of God? He's thinking of you. How selfless, right? How selfless is our Savior? That is a perspective that each and every one of us needs to have. So as we consider what we're doing here, if we feel like we're becoming weary and losing heart, if the race that's set before us is difficult at times, which it's going to be, I'll give you a heads up, it's going to be, focus on Christ. Focus on the Savior. It will be encouraging for you. Take your eyes off of the seen, the things that are seen, and put your eyes on the things which are unseen. Because the things which are unseen are eternal. And the things which are seen are temporal. That was one of our verses, right? It was one of our scripture passages that we were learning. This is, a, this is a passage I really want you to get. If you can memorize it, that's awesome. I want you to get this. What race are you running? Are you running your own? Are you running the race that he has set before you? Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus? Are you fixing your eyes on self? We all fail in this regard, by the way. That's why we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded of these things. Well, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, your word is so powerful. The things that we're learning about sin. I'm so thankful that when I was 17, you pierced through the veil and helped me to understand that all of my flailing about was useless, pointless. That I had no possible way to get to heaven. No possible way to have a right relationship with you apart from faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that you loved me enough, even though I had a sorry attitude, as Ranger Gary Horton likes to say, I had a sorry attitude and was involved in all, all sorts of sorry things as an unbeliever. You still love me enough to send your son to die for me. And I'm thankful that as we learn about sin, I pray, I pray that as we learn about these things, we will come to understand the sinfulness of sin and that we will never, never try to write off sin as no big deal. It is a big deal. Your son, my Savior, Jesus Christ, had to die for that sin. It's not a little thing. It's a big thing. So I pray that that is really written upon our hearts and we begin to understand the severity of sin. And I thank you for this reminder out of these two verses, really three, Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and 3, the reminder we have in those verses about how important it is to set aside our pride to get our eyes focused in the right place and begin to understand that you didn't save us so that we could just run around willy-nilly and do whatever. You saved us with a purpose. You have a plan for us. And it's actually a grace gift beyond belief that you have anything to do with me, that you would allow me to be your fellow worker is incredible, Father. So I thank you for that grace gift of a life that has a purpose. And I thank you for the eternal life that I should be living now, not waiting until I die to embrace eternal life. I have it now. Help us all to live in a, in a way where we 
please you with everything that we do, and we glorify your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen.